And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are we all doing this evening? Good, good, good. I'm glad. And uh, it seems that we've all gathered for a momentous occasion. Yes, it is a momentous occasion because we are finally celebrating the Shabbat. It is a weekly feast that the Lord has set apart since the beginning of time. If He rested, I think we can rest. So we say welcome, bienvenidos. If you are new here or new tuning in online, this is Mishkan David of uh, Sunrise, Florida. And my name is Thomas. I serve uh, with Rabbi Gabriel Simkin and Rabbitson Esther Simkin. And uh, we are very happy to have you all here this evening. The reason why this gathering is so special, so monumentous each and every single week is because of the implication of what's going on. As uh, I'm sure you see in this world, we are in the last of the last of the last days. There are lots of interesting things happening. For example, on Wednesday, it was reported the rainiest day in the history of Florida. And the testimonies of the end times will be that there would be weather patterns that we had never seen before. So that alone should give you an indication of the times we're in. Especially powerful because of why we gather here together. We are Jews and non-Jews alike who have finally come in agreement that Messiah or Jesus, who we call his true name, his original name, Yeshua, which is Hebrew salvation, we are finally in agreement as Jews and non-Jews together that he is the Messiah of Israel, the son of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the original founding fathers. And so we celebrate and gather in his name because like it says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20 that we quote every single week when there are two or three people gathered in his name, his promise is that he would be here in the midst of us. And so in the spirit of that, I would ask you to please stand. Uh, behind me, you see the Shabbat table, the elements. We have the candles, the bread, the wine, all very, very important pieces uh, of the Shabbat. And uh, specifically, we present this table at the beginning of our service, not only to bring us together in order, but uh, to, to point to our Messiah, everything that we do here points to Him uh, because He is everything. He was the way, the truth, and the life. And so we want to glorify Him and lift Him up, and He again will do what He promised, which is to draw every man unto Himself. And so this first blessing that we're going to partake together on the screen is the blessing over the candles. Very, very important. Uh, now, it is a, a traditional Jewish thing to light the candles on the Sabbath. Um, but they derive that from uh, the service of the Levitical priesthood in the tabernacle. The Lord commanded that candles would be lit 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a representation of himself because he is forever the light. He is never dim. He is always shining. And so it was supposed to be a representation of his presence in his house of worship. And so, as well, later on in the writings, we have many, many prophecies uh, about candlelight, but specifically, the most important one is in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, which was a, uh, a promise of a sign from the Lord to His people, and it said that uh, a virgin would conceive through the power of the Holy Spirit and give birth to a son. And so he himself called himself the light of the world, and he was born of a woman. And so we know that that was the sign from God to his people that his Messiah had come and that it was fulfilled. So it is amazing that the Jewish tradition uh, invites the woman or the matriarch of the home to light the candles. Um, in Judaism, it is because uh, the, the woman is the caretaker of the home, the caretaker of the family. She ensured that everything within the house was neat and in order, and um, as well, um, very beautiful that the light of the world did come through a woman. It is a revelation of the Holy Spirit given to us, and so we like to take the traditions of man, take them back for ourselves, and uh, point them to the Lord, to the Messiah. So our dear Rebetzin is going to come and light the candles for us, signifying that our Messiah was indeed born of a woman, that the prophecy did come to pass, that he is the light of the world, and he has called us to be the light as well.
ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידשנו בדברו ונתן לנו את ישוע משיקנו וסביבנו לאהוד אור העולם. בלס ארתא ולורד אר גאד קינג אוף דה יוניברס You have sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Bendito eres tu, Señor nuestro Dios, Rey del Universo. Tú nos has santificado con tu palabra. Nos has dado Yeshua, nuestro Mesías, y nos has mandado ser una luz para el mundo. Amén. Thank you, Robertson. The next prayer on the screen you're going to see is the blessing over the bread. Adrian, please come forth. And uh, what you're going to see in this young man's hand, in this tray, um, is a challah. And uh, if you were here with us, or if you follow the word of the Lord, then you know that uh, we recently celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, which was uh, proceeding after the Feast of Pesach, or Passover. Um, we don't necessarily have to go into that right now. If you're curious about that or what all of that means, we have our archives online. And then, of course, we have the true source, which is found in the Word of God. And you can find um, the commandments and the meaning of Passover in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, and it's in several different places in the Torah as well. Um, but the actual accounting of what happened at Pes Passover and Pesach is in Exodus chapter 12. And, uh, but Adrian has his hands, uh, a challah, uh, which uh, during the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread, we were using matzah, but uh, we are now concluded that as of this previous Wednesday. Um, and now we have a challah here. And uh, the reason why that we chose to present a challah every single week, uh, many, many moons ago, the Lord placed it on leadership's heart to do so, uh, was because, again, uh, we are aware that the God of Israel, he loves to use symbolism for his people because we are human beings. We have a finite brain, and so he gives us these object lessons and these pictures, uh, like the old adage, a picture is worth more than a thousand words. And so he gives us these items, these things, so that we can look at, so we can understand, we can touch and feel, um, because we do seek to worship him in spirit and in truth. But of course, he loves us very much. He understands our position and where we are. So he likes to help us with things like this. And uh, beautifully, the tradition of the challah is a recipe of three pieces of dough being braided into one loaf, which uh, if you know the story, of course, if you've been coming here a while, uh, Rabbi Gabe was watching the Rebetzin make a challah in the kitchen, and he saw her braiding these once three separate pieces of dough into one loaf, and uh, by the grace of God in that moment, he was able to hear the voice of God, and um, he, the Lord told him that it is a representation of himself. And then whenever you believe you've heard the word of God, you have to go to the word of God to confirm what you believe you've heard. And of course, there are several places in the Bible that the Lord represents himself as a multifaceted being. Uh, first off and foremost, in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26, he says, let us make man in our image. So immediately from the beginning of time, the Lord was revealing to us that he is not just a uh, one being, that he is multiple beings within one, which even sometimes that's hard to comprehend, but he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, right? So uh, part of faith is accepting him for who he is, and this is the way that the Lord decided to present himself to us, which is uh, part of the Hebrew word echad, which is a compound unity. It also means one. And then, of course, in uh, 1 John, in the Word of God, it says that there are three witnesses that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so three have become one. They present themselves as one. But we also do the blessing over the bread because of what our Messiah said during Pesach. Uh, in Luke chapter 12 is where he specifically says, do this in remembrance of me. And so we do the blessing over the bread every single week in remembrance of what our Messiah did on our behalf. He gave his body up so that we could not receive the punishment that was due upon us for our sins. He freely laid down his life, and we have the accounting of what he went through. It was a truly uh, brutal thing that he did on our behalf. Um, but then, of course, he stated, there is no gr greater love uh, a man has than this than to lay down his life for his friends. So it was the ultimate act of love, uh, subjecting himself to the abuse and the machinations of the Roman army, that his body was broken on our behalf. And so we do this every single week 
in remembrance of his sacrifice for us. So Adrian is going to take us through the prayer, the blessing over the bread, um, first in Hebrew and then in English. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who issues forth the bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and never taste them. Amen. If you feel led of the Holy Spirit, please partake in the body. The next prayer on the screen here is the blessing over the wine. Again, uh, because of Pesach, the communion is centered around Pesach. And so in a way, we're communally celebrating Pesach every single week together, um, even outside of the feast day itself. Um, but because of what the wine represents, we know that in the word of God, wine has represented blood that has been given to us since the beginning. And... Um, the reason why we know it represents blood is because of the thing that separates us from the Lord, which is sin. And unfortunately, throughout time, uh, despite the Lord uh, loving us and being gracious with us and desiring to have a relationship with us, we've kept making mistakes. Uh, we've kept uh, being imperfect, even though we are called to perfection. And so throughout time, the different covenants that the Lord established, first he had a covenant with Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, they ate from the tree. They broke that one commandment that they were supposed to do. Uh, then after that, the, uh, after many years of establishing relationships with people, the children of Israel were liberated from Egypt, from slavery, from sin. And uh, they were given the commandments and the sacrificial system so that with that, they would have an atonement for breaking the Lord's commandments. And then again, unfortunately, we know that the account is that we continue to err in our ways. And so finally, the Lord decided to um, eliminate the human element by sending his son as a human being, uh, which the word of God states that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh, to give us power over the flesh through the Holy Spirit by the blood of our Messiah. And so every single week we commemorate and, and, and thank him for this ultimate covenant that he has given us, that uh, by, our, by his stripes, not only are we healed, but we are washed by the blood of our Messiah so that we may be seen of our Father as white as snow, and that when we do make mistakes, because we will make mistakes, it is a life of perfection, a life of becoming perfected. We have the grace of our Messiah so that we can pick ourselves back up and keep going unto the end, because as it says in James 5, count them happy which endure to the end. And so we can continue going to the end because we have the blood of our Messiah, and our dear Adrian is going to take us through the prayer, first in Hebrew, then in English. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And as King David said, come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Taste and see. I got you juice, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So everything that we did here on the table, the candles, the bread, and the wine, this is um, a very, very, very Hebraic version of presenting the gospel. And you might say, well, how so? Because every single item points to the Messiah. As I stated earlier, everything that we do here is centered around the Messiah. So we have the candle, which is representing uh, the confirmation of his birth through Miriam, and uh, that he was the light. He commanded us to be the light. Then we have the bread and the wine, which is what he did on our behalf, the sacrifice of his body, 
the shedding of his blood. And uh, it is an invitation. It is an invitation that we make at the beginning of Shabbat every single week, uh, not only to commemorate the Shabbat and to bring us together as a family, but to make additions to the family because we are called to go and fish, be fishers of men. And uh, as Rabbi Gabe says, the only thing that you can take with you to heaven is the souls that you lay down as crowns at your father's feet. And so we make the invitation to accept the sacrifice of the Messiah every single week at the beginning of Shabbat um, because, again, it is Shabbat. And you can only truly experience Shabbat, which is just the Hebrew word for rest, if you have a relationship with the Lord. The Word of God says that there is no rest for the wicked, and we don't say that to condemn anyone or beat anybody up. We just um, state the fact that there can be no rest if you have a separation from God. And so we present the gospel in this manner every single week, uh, not only to be different, but we, we believe it to be a spirit-led invitation that it is before the Shabbat so that you can have your salvation and then enter into his rest. And then once you've done that, we have the next prayer on the screen, which is the Shema, because as many of uh, our attendees here know, it doesn't just end with salvation. Salvation is just the start. You are called to be born again. And so you receive the Holy Spirit, and then you become baptized, both in the Holy Spirit and in fire and in water, which is a declaration to the community that you're going to now be living your life for the Lord. And the way you live of your life for the Lord is spelled out in what he said to us. And um, so they asked him, uh, what is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the most important thing that you could do? And he responded, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, uh, which is the calling of loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength. And he had in mind because now we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so the kingdom of heaven is within us. And so you love the Lord with everything after your salvation. And that's how you embark on this journey of establishing a, establishing a relationship with him because salvation is only a ticket to get on the train. After that, you have to walk in the spirit as he commanded. And so you begin to learn how to walk in the spirit once you begin to love him with everything because when you love him with everything, you are then in his presence. And if you're in his presence, you can hear his voice through the Holy Spirit. And then through the Holy Spirit, you begin to be healed, changed, restored. And then once that happens, you can be of service to him because he said to himself, clean the inside of the cup first and then the outside shall be clean. And then after that, you can be used of service for the Lord. And of course, we are all on this journey of perfection together. We are not all 100% clean, but we are much cleaner now than when we started. And so we strive to be sinless, and on the way we will be sinning less by participating and loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength as our Messiah told us to do. And so we lift up his words, and you're going to hear this every single week. You're going to hear this in conversation. You're going to hear this on the Bema. So this is our mantra. This is our, our call to faith, our marching orders. And so please join me first in Hebrew, then in English. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Bauch Shem Kevot, Malchuto, Leolam Vaed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is his name whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. We thank you, Lord. Round of applause for him. And yes, this is a very, very important prayer. We are now in the middle of the Feast of Weeks, uh, the commandment of the children of Israel after Pesach, after uh, the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread, which is to count seven Sabbaths plus one day, which is where the Greek, uh, the word for 50 is penta. And then, of course, they made the feast name in Greek, which the common church now calls Pentecost. But uh, in the Hebrew, it is Shavuot, 
the Feast of Weeks. And so uh, it is a, a, a replication of what occurred with the children of Israel and with the disciples in the Word of God. First, the children of Israel were called to sanctify themselves at the base of Mount Sinai and wait for the promise of our Father. And of course, we are aware that they were not patient in their waiting for that promise. They uh, got distracted along the way. They asked Aaron to construct them a golden calf so that they could commit idol worship and all of these things. And of course, like Paul said, uh, that there are examples so that we don't make the same mistakes that they did, which thank God the disciples did the right thing. In Acts chapter 2, uh, Messiah Yeshua commanded them to wait in the upper room in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. And so once we've established our salvation, our relationship with Him, we start walking with the Lord, then we can start obtaining His promises. But His promises are conditional. His salvation was unconditional as a free gift. You can't do anything to earn it. All you can do is say yes or no. But then after that, to be blessed of the Lord, you have to be obedient. And so our call to obedience part is to celebrate the feasts of the Lord. And these feasts of the Lord give us the mindset of how we're going to be living our lives. And so just like the children of Israel, just like the disciples, by the grace of God, we already have received that promise, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But now we continuously in our lives wait on the promise of the Lord for us as individuals. Whatever the Lord told you he's going to do, he will do it. It's just when he wants to do it. When you're prepared and your heart is in the right place, he will fulfill his promises to you. And so together we uh, do this feast together and we count the Omar, uh, the, the seven Sabbaths plus one day. So please join me as we do it first in Hebrew, then in English. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidishanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu al sefirat haomer. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the counting of the Omer. Today is the ninth day of the Omer. May the merciful one restore unto us the service of the Beit Hamikdash to its place speedily in our days. Amen. And that last part, we say that because during the Feast of Pesach, they say next year in Jerusalem. So we know that part of the fulfillment of the return of the Messiah is for the third temple to be built. That's what many of us argue and believe to be true. And we have evidence in the word of God for that. So we ask for the service of his house to be restored speedily in our days. And I think uh, we're supposed to have the Kiddush prayer up there um, right now. Uh, this is the Rafua, which we will definitely talk about that. Uh, but the reason why we do the Kiddush prayer every single week is um, because what has been so beautifully revealed to us again in the word of God. Everything again, you're going to hear, we do our utmost to try to tie it with the word of God. And so the Kiddush prayer is not only honoring the God of creation, thanking him for this day, thanking him for choosing us, even though we were not worth choosing, thanking him for saving us, thanking him for everything that he has done. Um, because of Mo Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 5 that the Sabbath, Shabbat, is not just a day of rest, but is a day of remembrance. So the original R&R &R was rest and remembrance. And so we thank the Lord as we have passed through Pesach and we are now in this waiting period that the Lord has saved us from many things and we thank him for that and we thank him in advance for what he will do in our lives. So please join me as we recite the Kiddush prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav v'ratzavanu v'shabat kudosho b'havro atzon chinghilanu zikron l'meseh v'reshit ki hiyom tehila l'mekhe kodesh zehia l'tziat mitzrayim ki vana v'harta v'otanu kidashta mekol ha'amim v'shabat kudoshecha b'havro atzon chinghaltanu Baruch atah Adonai mekedesh ha'shabat Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor, he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose and us did you sanctify from all the nations, and your holy Sabbath with love and favor did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Amen. Amen.
And this last prayer is the refua, the prayer for healing. Uh, very, very significant prayer for here uh, with us. It is a compilation of a few uh, different places in the Word of God. Uh, but what it is specifically is a declaration of faith that we do believe the Lord is still the great physician, that He is still the ultimate healer, uh, and that He is still in the business of healing and restoring His people. Uh, but we put out a sort of message every single week before we recite this prayer today together um, because of what Messiah Yeshua said. And we know that um, healing is a gift of the Lord. It can happen instantaneously if he wants to, but sometimes he always doesn't. And if he doesn't, then we beg to ask the question, well, why didn't we get healed right away, Lord? And oftentimes we find out that if you talk to the Lord, he answers. And so uh, one thing that we do encourage, though, here communally together is that we have a clean heart because we know the Word of God talks about having a clean heart, that the Lord works in the matters of the heart. And uh, we have been aware of that uh, autoimmune diseases and other ailments where your own body attacks itself. It can be either from stress, but we also have discovered that it can have uh, an effect if you have a heart of stone or you have bitterness or unforgiveness within your heart. And so we don't declare that uh, it will be a guarantee in this moment if you forgive everyone that has harmed you in your life that you will be healed right away. It may, it may very well happen. We've seen it happen. But we, we do it together so that at least we are not sick for that reason. And so we uh, declare our hearts before the Lord so that he may invade it with his marvelous light, and we do that together every single week, graciously asking him for the restoration and healing of our lives. So again, we're going to go a little back and forth in Hebrew and in English together, please. Rafainu Adonai ven Erafe, Hoshienu veni Vashiach. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. Hetilatenu Ata, for you are our praise. Vehele refua shlema lechol machotenu, and bring complete healing for our ailments. Yechiratzon milfanecha Adonai Elohe velohe avote. May it be your will, O Lord my God, and the God of our forefathers. Shetishlach mehelefua shlima min hashemaim, that you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven, spiritual healing and physical healing, for you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, who heals the sick of his people, Israel, amen. And so now our dear Esti is going to take us through the call to worship, and we are then going to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise so that we may prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord. We love you all. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. And before we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise on this holy day known as Shabbat, this time of rejoicing, this time of joy and fellowship. I'm going to play the sound of the shofar. It's just, it is a call to worship and a call to peace. And on the Shabbat, of course, it has significance, uh, tremendous significance, because it is a reminder that this day is special, that this 24-hour period was sanctified by God himself. He himself set it apart, and that he is resting even now as we speak, and he commands us to rest as well. Um, and as you listen to the sound of the shofar, I would encourage you, if you haven't done it already, to call upon the name of Yeshua, to meditate on his name, to meditate on the greatness of our God and King, and uh, to remember that without him there is no Shabbat Shalom, there is no Prince of, because he is the Shabbat Shalom, the Prince of Peace. So uh, as we listen to the sound of the shofar, we call upon the name of Yeshua, the Shabbat Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Yom Hashishi, 
ויכולו השמיים והארץ וכל צבאם, ויכל אלוהים ביום השביעי מלאכתו אשר עשה, וישבות ביום השביעי מכל מלאכתו אשר עשה, ויברך אלוהים את יום השביעי ויקדש אותו, כי הוא שבת מכל מלאכתו אשר ברא אלוהים לעשות. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who commands us to rest on the Shabbat, rest our hearts, our minds, our souls, to rest in your presence in fellowship with you and in fellowship with one another. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, keeper of promises, promise that you would send a deliverer, a Messiah, to save fallen humanity, to save us from ourselves. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because you did exactly that, and Messiah Yeshua came to teach us for three years how to walk in righteousness. By his own example, he taught us what it really means to be an obedient son or daughter of the living God. And then he didn't stop there. He left us with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of us who accepts him has the Ruach HaKodesh inside of us. We now have the power to be obedient sons and daughters of the living God. We are no longer slaves to sin. We can, we have, we can choose to do the right thing. We no longer have excuse. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah Yeshua taught us that if you cleanse the inside of the cup first, the outside would be cleansed as well, and that true righteousness begins in the heart first. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because you'll send the Messiah again very soon now. As the angel said when the disciples were looking up as Messiah Yeshua ascended to heaven, the angel said, the same Yeshua whom you see risen will return again as you see him. And he will take his rightful place on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And he will be established as king and high priest over Israel and over all of humanity, ushering in, O Lord our God, your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, and at long last, bringing about true peace on earth and goodwill to all men. As we enter, Lord, into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise, we remember the words of Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes and said in his wisdom, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. And the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease, because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. And the doors will be shut in the street when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. The words of the wise are as gold and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Praise you. We thank you, Lord. As we enter into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise, we meditate on the fact that you are Adonai Elohai, the God, our God, the great I am.
For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusts in thee.
should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endures but for a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning.
And finally, as the apostle encourages us, let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Messiah Yeshua, giving thanks to God and the Father by him.
to praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, honey. Beautiful worship. Thank you, dancers. Beautiful dance. King David dance before the Lord. Anyone happy to be in the house of the Lord besides me? We made it. Through rain and thunder and lightning. Thank God the Mishkan didn't flood. Uh, this area of town got 10 inches of rain. Uh, the airport, Hollywood International, Hollywood Fort Lauderdale Airport, had almost 26 inches of rain. That's over two feet of rain. They shut the airport down. How do I know? Because I dropped my daughter off there Wednesday at 2 p.m. to fly back to um, Melbourne, and she never made it back. She stayed at the airport till 3.30 in the morning. They shut the airport down. She was calling me, and I was like, I'm not coming to get you. I don't have a boat. And... Uh, she finally got together with other people, rented a car, and was able to leave the airport about 3.30 in the morning. Her flight was supposed to be Wednesday afternoon at 3.45 p.m. She was on the plane, but they couldn't fuel it, and they couldn't put the luggage on there. It was raining so hard. And so she had to get off the plane, get her luggage back, but she made it home about 3.30 in the morning, and she just flew out today. I took her again to the airport, same flight, and she was able to make it out. But the airport was shut down from Wednesday afternoon, early afternoon until this morning. Unheard of. And the amount of rain, um, the previous record for Fort Lauderdale International Airport, well, I just read that, is 14.79 inches, happened in 1979, and we just had almost 25 inches. Shattered the old record. And I was like, Lord, you promised you weren't going to flood the world. I had to remind them, remember the rainbow, Lord. You set, you set the rainbow in the sky, so you promised not to drown us. I guess he must have heard because he cut it off. Just as the water was reaching my halfway up my driveway and halfway up the lake where we live, our lawn, I was like, Lord, come on now. And, and, and this happened on the last day of Passover, by the way. Very interesting. All of Broward got baptized on the last day of Passover. On the seventh day of Passover, everyone got baptized. Some cars got baptized. They're still baptized. They're underwater. Some folks, no lives were lost. Just property. And, uh, but praise God. And of course, the Mishkan is dry, thank God. And nothing happened here. A couple of roof leaks. Do we have a couple of roof leaks? I noticed my, my, my book here got a little wet. The, the bima here where I stand is anointed. I get a little rain right here. I get a little reminder from the Lord that he's still almighty and he's still in charge. And if he just flicked his fingers like this, we'd all drown. And that's what the, the psalm says, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? That he even cares about us. He really does care about us. But it also talks about, in the end times, it talks about that people's hearts would be failing them. In Luke chapter 21, one of the signs of the end times, that people's hearts would be failing them for looking upon the things that are coming on the earth. And we're starting to see some wild stuff happening. You know, nature, weather patterns. Um, the Lord said there'll be earthquakes in different places. It's, it's going to get interesting. And this is the time, if you start to notice these things, this is the time to really get close to the Lord. Not get further away from the Lord. 
We need to get closer to the Lord because he is our shield, as he told Abraham, and he's our protection, and he is our exceeding great reward. He's our provision. And so, you know, thank God, you know, thank God that we have him because this world is a dangerous place. And, it's, and, and, and the Lord used, used weather. He said, when the rains come, the winds, and, uh, and beat on your house, the floods, and if you stand on the word of God, you are standing on a sure foundation, he said. Those things will not destroy, you know, your life. But if you hear God and you don't do what he says and these things happen to you, you will fall apart. And many people are going to fall apart. I mean... We're starting, to, we're starting to see some strange things happening in the world. And, and of course, um, big powers are starting to get together and starting to plot and war and rumors of wars, just like Yeshua said. So it's very interesting time, especially, I know, that uh, we could be that generation that sees the return of the Lord. We could be that generation. And... Um, so very interesting, you know, what happened this week here in Broward County. By the way, the governor of the state of Florida declared Broward County as, as, as an emergency, um, state of emergency, by the way. Anyway, uh, guess which psalm we're going to do today because of what happened. Psalm 23. And then we'll pray, and then we'll continue talking about him, of course. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4, very important. Yea. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Very appropriate psalm. Thank you, Lord. That he is with us. And if he is with us, the Bible says, what, who, nothing can be against us. Just remember, he is almighty. And everything is subject to him as we continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you tonight. We call upon you in the name above every name, the name Yeshua. We praise you and thank you for protecting us. We praise you and thank you for providing for us supernaturally. Lord, we can, we can only thank you and praise you and, and appreciate you and say we love you and, and, and we just we want to draw closer to you as your, as your word says, Lord, as we draw close to you, that you draw close to us. We need you, Father in heaven, more than ever. We need you to comfort us and reassure us that we shall fear nothing and no one in this world, Lord. We thank you that you will never leave us or forsake us. And Abba, Father, we thank you and praise you that you've given us power over all the power of the enemy to tread on them. We take this authority in the name of Yeshua, commanding every unclean spirit, breaking every assignment of the enemy against us individually, against our families, against the congregation, against the Mishkan. In the name of Yeshua and Father in heaven, as we rejoice in our salvation, our names written in heaven, Heavenly Father, your spirit bearing witness with our spirit, that we're your sons and we're your daughters, we pray for and intercede for family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, Father in heaven, that no one should be separated from you, that they would be reconciled to you as you reconciled us, that they would taste and see that you are good, that their names would be written in heaven like our names would be written in heaven. That's our heart, Lord, 
for everyone, even our enemies, Lord, we pray for in the name of Yeshua. And as we look around this room and there are brothers and sisters that are not here, that you've called to be here for whatever reason, wherever they are, Father in heaven, touch them wherever they are, heal them, restore them, set the captives free. And Father in heaven, let them come to your house, let them brag about you among the family of God here, in the name of Yeshua. And Abba, Father, bless those watching on the internet. Bless us together. Teach us, Abba, Father in heaven, not to live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth, Lord. Teach us to live this way, led by your precious Holy Spirit. Father, give us supernatural ears to hear your voice because you declared your sheep hear your voice. Lead us, Lord. Speak to our lives. Speak to our situations. Speak to every obstacle in our life. In the name of Yeshua. And Abba, Father, we thank you and praise you for every single thing that has happened in our lives to this very moment. Because your word declares that all things do work together for the good because we love you and because you have called us for your purpose. Father in heaven, thank you for your purpose to conform each and every one of us into the image of your Son, our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior, our King. In his name we pray tonight. The name above every name, the name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray. And the people of God said that we should be taught not to live by bread only. By the way, Passover is over. Even though Passover is only one night, what we celebrate the seven days is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And many of us were led by the Holy Spirit not to eat leaven for the entire week. Did you notice how you had a, if you didn't eat leaven for the week, they had to check everything you put in your mouth? That it didn't have yeast in it? Um, we, even had a, we even had a controversy with soy sauce. Because many soy sauces have yeast in them. But I found one that didn't have yeast. And, uh, but you got to check everything that you put in your mouth. And it is a, it is a yeast fast for, for our bodies. I, think, I, 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 it's, I don't know if you noticed, but you, did you feel less uh, what's, uh, um, bloated? If you noticed when you eat yeast, yeasty breads, you get bloated. And, uh, and our bodies, not only does our, the, the Lord care about our spiritual well-being, He cares about our bodies. He cares, you know, when people read the Old Testament, they say that's legalism. I say it's love because God is concerned about everything that man did, about Israel. He was concerned with what they ate, what they wore, how they worshipped how they treated each other. I mean, that's somebody who really cares about you. Because when somebody cares about you, they, they want to speak into your life, every area of your life. When somebody doesn't care about you, they don't care what you do or say or do or what you eat. Eh, eat whatever you want. Oh, you know, wear rags for all I care, you know. Um, but, I mean, God was concerned about everything, every area of their life. Um, and that, that should speak to us as New Covenant believers that now we have the Lord, the Lord of the Sabbath living inside of us, the living God living inside of us, and he's still concerned about every area of our life. Every area of our life. And we'll speak to every area of our life if you acknowledge him. Because a lot of people live their lives as if they're alone. And once you're born again of the Holy Spirit, we are no longer by ourselves. We invited him into our lives. We gave him access to our lives. And it says those who are led of the Spirit, they're the sons of God. But you, in order to be led, you have to allow yourself to be led. And you have to allow him to speak into your life. And you have to acknowledge him in all of your ways. It says... Do not lean upon your own understanding. In other words, God gave us reason. God gave us a brain. God gave us our own limited understanding. But it's, as, I, as I said, it's limited at best. He is unlimited. 
Uh, he is supernatural. He knows everything about everything because he created everything. Everything we see, the Bible says, has been created by the one we cannot see. So imagine now having the Holy Spirit now, and we're still living as if we're by ourselves and not acknowledging him in all of our ways. Many brothers and sisters believe you can't hear from God, which, I mean, that's criminal to tell a child of God you can't hear from your Father in heaven. All you can do is read what he said before, uh, which is fine. I mean, that's known as the Logos. Logos is what God has said and what God has done, but he is not the great I was. He is the great I am. That's what the Bible says. And once you understand that, yes, we read and we study history because this is all history now but we study his story because we want to have this amazing relationship that's available to every single one of us but again if you live like you're by yourself things don't really change because you're still making decisions in your own life you're still relying upon your own understanding and as I said before, it is limited at best. Our own understanding, our own knowledge, our own wisdom. And the Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit being the spirit of knowledge and wisdom. Compare our knowledge and wisdom to his knowledge and wisdom. Who are you going to rely on? Our limited knowledge and wisdom or his unlimited knowledge and wisdom in every decision that we make in our life? I would imagine that if we made decisions based on his leading, we could all say, I would have made much better decisions in my life. Because remember, and I, and I, and I remember this, this, this um, preacher saying this, and I've never forgotten this, that where your life is at right now is a sum total of decisions you've made. You can blame whoever you want to, you can make any excuse you want to, but you made the decisions. Ultimately, everything of your life, you decide. In other words, you take in information and you make decisions based on the information that you take in. And you try to make, of course, the best decisions that you can for your own benefit or your own life. And you do this on a limited basis, on limited knowledge limited information, um, not knowing what the future holds, guessing, you can't say amen, say oh me, and even, even with the best intentions, we make some pretty poor decisions, even with the best intentions. And the problem is, God still loves you, God's still there, but you have to, you know, like the old saying, you make your bed, you gotta, you gotta sleep in it, in other words, he can watch you make your own decisions. He's given you free will. I mean, free will is a double-edged sword. It can work for you. It can work against you. If you make your own decisions, you can't blame God for them because you made decisions based on your own knowledge and wisdom. I remember a couple of years back, I was complaining to the Lord because, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm becoming a senior citizen. I am a senior citizen. I'm like, Lord, when do I get to retire? And I started complaining about my job. And the Lord said this to me. You wanted a big house. He said that to me. He said, you wanted a big house. And what am I going to argue? I said, you're right. I wanted a big house. Well, a big house comes with a big mortgage. And it took me 18 years to pay off that mortgage, a 30-year mortgage. You know, thank God I paid it off early, but it was 18 years of labor of paying off this mortgage. And I was complaining to the Lord, but when he told me, you wanted a big house, I said, I had to agree, you're right. I, we could have stayed in our condo that we lived in. We would have had that paid off 18 years ago. But we decided to sell our condo. We had a two-bedroom condo. And we said, no, we wanted a bigger place. And I remember when we moved, 
we packed this huge moving truck in a, from a two-bedroom condo. It was only like 900 square feet. I mean, you could put stuff in every little crack you know, where you live, like pack rats. And I remember they, they like took two guys the whole day. We had like this, this, what were those, this 45-footer, 50-foot trucks that showed up, one of these giant trucks. We filled it up. And we show up at our house. This was in 2004. And we unload this huge truck in this house, and it looked empty. <laughs> I mean, it looked like we had nothing. And so we like, we got to fill this place up. And it's taken years, but I, can you imagine if we had to move now, we probably need like a fleet of trucks. I'm not moving. That's it. I don't care if they give me a million bucks for my house. I ain't going nowhere. That's it. They're going to take me out feet first. I mean, crazy. And so the, the point I'm making is that's the decision that I made. You want a big house? Here you go. Here's your job to pay for your big house. The Lord blessed me with a big house and blessed me with a nice job to pay for it. Not this job. This job to pay is not much, but the benefits are out of this world. But the Lord blessed me with a nice job to pay for this house. But then I was complaining about the job that was paying for the house. And like the Lord said to me, you wanted a big house. I mean, when he tells you stuff like that, you got to shut up. Because he's always right. I like, I had to like, you're right, Lord. I'm complaining to him about my decisions. I mean, praise God, you know. that. But as I was saying Saturday, if you notice, we were talking about Moses and how Moses interacted with the Lord, it was a real conversation. It was a, it, it was, it was a two-way conversation. Most people, the way they're taught to pray, it's like mechanical. It's like you're talking to a robot. Our Father who art in heaven. And you talk to him like he's not real. And God is real. And you need to talk to him like he's real. Because he's real. And he's up to date on everything, he's a 21st, yeah, he's a first century God, but he's a 21st century God. He was, he is, and he will be forever. And he always will be the great I am. And that's the interaction that he wants to have with us, father-son, father-daughter relationship, where you can get real with God. And once you understand that, your prayer life is going to change. You're not going to act religious around him. I mean, he's, I mean he, was, he was complaining to the Pharisees. He was saying, vain, you talk to me with vain repetitions. You, like, repeat yourself. I mean, if you're having a conversation with somebody and they're repeating themselves over and over, like, hey, dude, I'm standing, like, right in front of you. Why do you keep repeating? I heard you the first time. They think that they will be heard with much speaking. You don't have to re remind God a million times of things that he already knows. He knows that you have need of before you even ask. In other words, he's telling you, I'm up to date. I know what's going on in your life. You know, talk to me real and listen to me because that's another thing. And it's not an audible voice. It's not an external voice. You know, so your ears aren't going to help you in your interaction with God. Um, what's going to help you is you have to train your spiritual being, your soul inside your body to hear in the spirit, to hear his voice in the spirit, which is a little different because most people only hear, you know, with their two ears. That's it, you know, external. But you have to train yourself to hear God internally. Are you with me? And when you train yourself to hear from God in internally, you will hear God. You will hear. He will speak into your life. He spoke into their life. He will speak into your life. If you listen, if you acknowledge him, if you let him speak into your life, if you let him lead you, because this is amazing. Um, and, the, and, the, and the reason I'm bringing all this up is because we just finished unleavened bread and God was not finished with Israel. 
he now tells them to wait in Jerusalem. Listen to this. Wait in Jerusalem for, for some kind of promise from the Father. Now, do you think that every person listened to him, what he told them? Or not, not to say they didn't listen. They heard him because he was speaking to them audibly. But he tells them to wait, which is one of the hardest things for us people that are impatient to do. We have a hard time waiting. If you can't say amen, say on me. But the Bible says, be still and know that he's God. In other words, if you're going to allow someone to lead you other than yourself, you have to wait on that person to make decisions for you. In other words, you're going to stop making decisions, you're going to acknowledge him in all of your ways, and he's going to decide for you. Most people have no clue that they can live this way. Even people that declare their love for God still live as if they don't have God in their life. They continue to make decisions. They continue to do things without Him. And that's totally opposite of what God has in mind for us. Because imagine your life being led by your wisdom as opposed to your life being led by God's wisdom. Would your life be different? In every area of your life, physically, spiritually, would every area of your life benefit from living this way? And that's what's available to us in this amazing new covenant that God has made with us. But I mean, we've gotten all these religious folks, you know, putting their two cents in, and they've kind of killed everything. Because the problem with leadership is they want to control. And, and basically, it's, it's, it's a control issue. Because I'm telling you that, I, that I'm suggesting God control your life as opposed to me controlling your life. Oh, I'm the leader of the Mishkan. You must obey me. I mean, I don't have that, that kind of ego. Because I don't, I, I, don't, I don't have that kind of relationship with God. So why would I tell you you know, something different. I want you to have this amazing relationship with the Lord that I've discovered. And it has to do between you and God, not people. We no longer, he said, don't call any man father. How many know fathers make decisions for you? Don't call any man rabbi. It's Rabbis make decisions for you. He's saying, I'm your rabbi. There's one father. I'm your teacher now. In other words, I'm, I'm, I, want to, I want to speak into your life, and I want to lead you now, and I want to take care of you. But you got to let go of these other people that took care of you, that led you, that, that provided for you. Now I'm going to provide for you. Now I'm going to lead you. I mean, that's amazing. We're, we're giving up limited uh, resources and people, and we're, and, and we're, and we're, and we're, we're embracing, hopefully, Unlimited, someone who's unlimited, someone who knows everything about everything. In other words, we're giving up the lesser to, to, to acquire the greater. Are you with me? Because people, I don't want to give up this, and I don't want to. What are we giving up? We're exchanging. I'm exchanging. I've exchanged uh, uh, relying on humans, and now I've exchanged it because now I'm on, uh, relying on my Father who is in heaven, who is spirit. And I now have learned to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I want this amazing relationship that God has for me. And I want to speak to him like he's real because he is. And I want to have this interaction that, that these people in the Bible had, that Moses had with them. I want to have this kind of relationship with God back and forth and talking and reasoning and asking questions and even complaining to him. God, I mean, I'm complaining about my job and I'm complaining about the person I'm working for. And he said, you wanted a big house. That shut me right up. Complain over. Because he was right. I helped you get this house you wanted. I helped you get the income to pay for this house. And now you're complaining. In other words, I gave you what you wanted. And now you're complaining about it. And when he told me that, I was like, sorry, me wrong, you right. And doesn't it say that, that we're always repenting? 
He doesn't have to repent. Because when you're always right, you don't have to repent. You only need to repent when you're wrong. That's why we're always the ones that are asking God to forgive us. Because he's always right. He doesn't have, he doesn't have to ask forgiveness from us. And, uh, I mean, that's an amazing... I mean, would you call that a religion? Would you call that... I mean, as a matter of fact, what I'm getting in my spirit, God doesn't call this a religion. God calls this a covenant. You know, we call it religion. Like people will say to me, I don't like religion. And you know what I tell them? I don't like religion either. I agree with them. That freaks them out. You know, because people say, I don't like religion. And you're like, you know, and you try to, and you try to justify some kind of religious behavior. I don't justify religious behavior. If somebody says, I can't stand religion, I say, or people say, I don't like organized religion. I said, come to the Mishkan. We're disorganized. <laughs> We're disorganized religion. Because we want to have a relationship with God. And as you do this, you will make some blunders. Because, I mean, how many people can let go of their, of their parental guidance and their, and, and, and their spiritual guidance from people you know, whether it, was, whether it was church or synagogue, and all of a sudden rely upon our Father who's in heaven that you can't see, and, and, and hearing him internally, spiritually. I mean, that takes some training. It's not instant. And you got to crawl before you can walk, and of course the adversaries there trying to trip you up and mess you up and uh, confuse you. I mean, it's a learning experience. I mean, he wasn't kidding when he said, you must be born again, meaning you got to start over. I mean, that's what basically he was saying. What's born again mean? It means you're starting over. Why are you born again now? You're born again spiritually now. You're now going to learn how to live a spiritual life the way you were born physically, and you learn how to live a physical life. Weren't you taught physical things? Sit up straight. This is how you cut your food. This is how you get dressed. This is how you wash yourself, brush your teeth. I mean, what didn't they tell you? Yay or nay? And they taught you how to live as a physical being. Now God is saying you're born again. I want you to learn how to be a spiritual being. Because that's what you are. You can deny it all you want to, but you are. He's the great I am, and you is that you is. I am, and you is. I was, and you wasn't. I will be, and you might not be. That's up to him, yay or nay. I mean, he gets to choose the characters that are going to spend eternity with him. Think about that. I mean, he can discard us. And he's warning us that I will discard you. I will make you disappear. I mean, I will put you in the lake of fire. And he said, prepare it for the devil and his angels. In other words, if you don't get with my program, I have the authority to make you disappear. I made you appear. I can make you disappear. Did you make yourself appear? No. Not only did you not make yourself appear, um, he can make you disappear. That's a scary thought. Yay or nay? And, uh, I mean, even physical death doesn't scare people. Because it says the fear of the Lord, doesn't it? I mean, every single one of us is looking at, at some future date with the undertaker. And that doesn't, make, that doesn't sober you up. I mean, people just just go forward like bulls in a china closet, just marching to their eternal death or separation from God, and everything's okay. I was like, oh. I mean, Yeshua's ministry started out with repent. In other words, repentance means you, you, you ask God to forgive you for the way you were living, and now you're going to live in a different way. Repentance is not crying and still doing the same thing and crying some more. That's insanity. Insanity is doing the same things over and over, expecting different results. Repentance means you're going to stop being this, this carnally-minded, 
a, a one-dimensional being, and you're going to accept now that you're born again, Holy Spirit filled, and you're going to be a spiritual being, and and the only one. I, I mean, I mean, are there any college courses out there for spiritual being led of the Spirit? Is there, you know, a Holy Spirit 101, Holy Spirit 102, a doctor in an Holy Spirit? You see the problem? And then these people that are, that are called ministers of the Word of God, they go to these, these seminaries, and they're not taught any of this stuff. All of a sudden, God is dead. The Holy Spirit stopped doing what he did. That died with the apostles. We don't believe in miracles anymore. There's no more supernatural. We'll wait for the rapture or you're on your own. And, and people say the new covenant is better than the old covenant. Uh, if, that's, if that's your doctrine, if that's your theology, I'll take the old covenant over the new covenant. Because the old covenant, God interacted with his people. I mean, he chastised them. He rebuked them. I mean, he gave them consequences. He, he complained about them. I mean, he, I mean, but they were like, it was like interaction. And all of a sudden, we have a better covenant, but God is dead. You can't hear him from him anymore. You know, and it, don't call that a better covenant, please. Not around me, anyway. Better covenant is that God is now living inside you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And God is very much alive and personal inside of your body. This is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what it says? What does that mean? He's no longer in buildings. He's now in your building. He's in your, he's in your, in your, in your substance. He's in your being. He's with you. And he's, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. My sheep hear my voice. Let me lead you to still waters, green pastures. Let me restore your soul. Let me set a table for you in the presence of your enemies. You know, let, you can have intimacy with me no matter how many crazies are around you. How many people don't believe this. Doesn't matter. You hear nay. You can have this with me. Doesn't matter how many people don't believe. Doesn't matter who's around you, what's around you. You now have this opportunity. He'll restore you. He'll lead you. I mean, is that a deal? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear because you're with me. I mean, that's King David. I mean, King David knew what it is to be anointed and to have the Holy Spirit, which in the Old Testament, only a few had that kind of privilege. Now all of a sudden, Yeshua dies, rises from the dead on the, first, on, on the Feast of First Fruits, just like the Bible Predicted and or, or or the feast of the Lord found in Leviticus twenty three. Then he tells them to count. The, the Bible says now count seven Sabbaths. Um, after you wave the, the the sheaf of the offering after first fruits, you count seven Sabbaths plus one day, as T was saying. You you count. They say count the Omer. That's not accurate. We're not counting Omer. We're counting Sabbaths. It says seven times seven is forty nine. Plus one day, he said, makes the number 50. And all of a sudden, the church says, we got Pentecost. Which Pentecost in Greek is 50. We get the number 50 where the church gets the word Pentecost. Which God did, does an amazing thing on that first Pentecost because he tells them, wait in Jerusalem. He appears before them. Wait, guys, for the promise. Let's go, go, go to Acts chapter 1 um, with me. Are you with me? I mean, we got, we got, we're counting seven weeks. Is this, was this the second week already? T? Week number two? This was the ninth day of the Omer. So we're counting. We're already past one Sabbath. So we're, we're going to count 50. So we got a few weeks to talk about the promise of the Father. Hello? And, and you know, people, I have been criticized for speaking too much about the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have something better than the Holy Spirit, 
please let me know. And if you're an expert on the Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit and hearing from God, let me know. Because most of us are gropers, kind of in the dark, trying to figure out how to have a relationship with God. And you may not get it in seven weeks, okay? It may take you quite a few weeks after receiving the promise of the Father to even realize what you have, number one, and number two, what to do with it. And if you can't be honest with yourself, too bad. I can't help you. I mean, if you think about what God has promised us and what God has fulfilled and what he has given us, because it's a gift, he gave it to us, that we now are anointed with the same Holy Spirit that was on the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, we now have this gift, and we act like, if we can be honest, it's not a big deal. How many know it's a very big deal? How many know it's a huge deal? With a capital H. With a capital huge. It's a really big deal. And if you don't look at it as a big deal, you don't know what you got. And if you don't know what you got, I bet you don't know how to use it. And you don't know how to be led of the Holy Spirit. And you don't have a clue. Now, I'm not saying this to put people down. I'm saying you need to pay attention. Because it says the greatest among you shall be your ministers. My job with the level of maturity that I've attained in my own relationship with God is to help you in your own maturity is to help you and to, and to help you in your own relationship with God so that you can reach some kind of level of maturity. Because let me tell you something. You can stay immature in God and as a child of God with the Holy Spirit your entire life. And the Bible warns against that. You're only going to mature at your speed, at your level, as you sow, doesn't the Bible say you will reap what you sow, what you put into it? If you don't think this is a big deal, if you don't think this is huge, if you don't think this need, you need to put some teeth into this, and you basically need to learn how to live over. Because, because the Bible says once you have the Holy Spirit, how many people have the Holy Spirit here, and you're born again of the Holy Spirit? You know what it says about your, your old life? 2 Corinthians 5 says, All things have passed away. In other words, the moment you got the Holy Spirit, you can wave goodbye to your old life. Everything you did and everything you was no longer is. You can, you can, you can, you can forget it. No longer applicable. Are you with me? Keep your finger here in Acts chapter 1. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. So you can see I'm not making things up. Somebody say, time to take the Holy Spirit serious. I mean, I've seen such a lackadaisical approach to the Holy Spirit. It's like, man, you got no clue what you are letting go by in your life. And we'll get to that in a minute. There's another scripture that I, you know, about talking about immaturity. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if any man be in, in Christ and the Messiah, what is he? How new are you when you're in Christ or you're in the Messiah? How new are you? Old things are what? I mean, would you say that the Word of God is telling us we're completely different? Yeah. In other words, we're completely different now the moment you accepted the Lord and you got the Holy Spirit. You asked Him to forgive you of your sins. Anybody do that here? Yeah. You asked Him to come into your life. You invited Him. 
Did you do that? The moment you did that, and the moment he took up residence in you through the person of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, which is now we're counting seven weeks towards Pentecost. Are you with me? So you're a new creature. All things are what? Say bye to my past. Goodbye. Ciao. Sayonara. Goodbye. Because all things are what? Now we're looking forward. It's B.C., before Christ, and A.C., B.C., A.C. Everything that was no longer is applicable. We're what? New creature. Look in the mirror and go, new creature. But when you look in the mirror, you look like the old creature. See, that's what's deceiving. You see the old creature because the old creature is still the creature outside. But the new creature is inside where you can't see. Are you with me? Because God is now inside you, which he wasn't there before. Because you invited him in. Are you with me? So now everything is new, and um, would you need some lessons, maybe some training, would you say? Would you need some training? Is it okay if we get some training now that we're this, you know, what am I type of, what am I now? You're a new creature, what does that mean? It means old things have passed away, everything has become new, well, how am I new? What is new about my life? What do I need to learn about this new person that I am? Because if you do things in the old way, what will happen? Somebody say, nothing. Nothing will happen. In other words, if you don't realize you're a new creature, you will do things in the old way and when you do things in the old way what's going to change nothing's going to change and you know what happens when nothing changes you get frustrated thank you you get mad and you might even get mad at God so um Galatians. I mean, this scripture I remember years ago hit me right between the eyes. You know, when some of these things that you look at and it hits you like right between the eyes, it like you're looking at yourself here. Uh, Galatians 4 and verse 1. Because here we are, a bunch of new creatures, and what are we doing? We're trying to hang on to the old creature or the past. In other words, in other words, what should we be doing with our with our past now that we're new? You should be releasing, just you know, let it go, say goodbye to your past, correct? Because the only way you're gonna live a new life is if you stop doing things in the old way. Now, if you don't release the past, which you have a choice, you don't have to release the past if you don't want to. You can live like the old person, yay or nay. God gives you a free will. Now I say that the heir, what is an heir? Someone who inherited something. I mean, think about what you've inherited and what you have now in this new life, in this new creature, in this new future that you now and I have. How much did we inherit of our Father who is in heaven? If you're his son or you're his daughter, can you say, I've inherited everything that my Father has? Everything that the Father has is now available to me? I mean, if you, have, if you live... In a parental home, 
Do they tell you, you can't touch this, you can't eat that, you can't step over here, uh, you must sit in the corner your whole life. No, it's like, this is our house. Everything here we share and belongs to you because you're my son and you're my daughter. Yay or nay? Unless you have creepy parents, which, a disclaimer, if you have creepy parents that don't act like you're their child, you got a problem. But how many of our Father in Heaven is not like that? He's awesome. My kingdom is now, is now yours. Hello? So think about the way you think, even. Because as a man thinks, in other words, you got to tell yourself, I'm an heir of God. I'm a full heir. Yeah, it ain't. You just inherited everything that God is and everything that God has. I mean, we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. I can no longer think as an orphan. I can no longer think that I'm separated from God or that I'm rejected by God. God, I'm reconciled to God. God has moved inside of me now. Everything that is his now is, I'm a, uh, am I an heir? Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, as long as a full heir of God is what? Immature, would you say? Is that a good word here? As long as you stay immature, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. In other words, immaturity equals servanthood. And how many know we're no longer servants? We're sons and we're daughters of the Most High God. He doesn't treat us like slaves. He doesn't treat us like property. We're no longer chattel. I own you, and you're a piece of garbage. No, you're a precious stone. You're, you're my son now. You're my daughter. You're now a full heir of everything that I have. Hola? I mean, come on now. That should bring a smile to your face. It's either a better covenant or it isn't. Gear and nay. So as long as he is a child, this person that's an heir, somebody say, I'm an heir of God, though it differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. And notice what it says, but as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. In other words, immaturity means you're still in bondage with the things that are in the world. You're attached to the world. And it says if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. In other words, if you're a new creature, you're no longer of the world. Like the Lord said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You've been raised up to sit in heavenly places. So as this new spiritual creature that we are, born again of the Holy Spirit, you can no longer think and act like your old self. Are you with me? We now are to be spiritually minded, godly minded, and now earthly minded. In other words, we're to think different, we're to act different, we're to walk different. We're to look at ourselves different. I am different now. And when the devil tries to remind me of what I used to be, I remind him of his future. All I say to the devil is, lake of fire. Because how many know that's his future? He hates that. You know why? Because it's the truth. Because he's trying to get me to think of what I used to be. I am nothing like I used to be. I am completely new. And the only thing that needs to catch up is 
Because old thinking will keep you disinherited. Yay or nay? Old thinking no longer works. Even if you try old thinking, it doesn't work because you're not that anymore. So even if you try to be your old self, I don't know if you tried this. Most of us do. Even Israel tried it. What did they do? They want to try to go back to Egypt? Nobody here like that. We got a few Egyptians here, trust me. They want, they want to go back to Egypt. I even thought when I first came into the kingdom of God, these weird things were happening to me. I thought I was better off back there. And that's Israel. That was their reaction, if you remember. They began to lead this new life. They got a little weirded out. You know, we've never been led by a pillar of, of smoke in the day or a pillar of fire by night. God's never spoken to us before. Now all of a sudden we got God in our camp. He's leading. And they're like, you know, we're not used to this. You know, put us back in Egypt. And he's like, can't go back to Egypt. Sorry. If you go back to Egypt, Pharaoh's there waiting to kill you. He will kill you. Don't go back. No going back. So even if you try to go back, it doesn't work. Because that door is closed. Now you're kind of forced to go forward. And most of us, you know, it reminds me, the, the beautiful card, you ever see that? Where there's two sets of footprint in the sand. And then there's only one set of footprints. And then it said, when I couldn't walk anymore, God carried me. It's a beautiful, I, I've seen it, it's so beautiful. Mine doesn't have one. Mine has drag marks. Because God had to drag me. Because I didn't understand any of these things. And you don't get a lot of spiritual leaders talking this way. I don't know if you guys, I mean, they seem to talk about money more than the Holy Spirit. I got a problem with that. Because being led of the Spirit is much more superior than all the tea in China, all the money. I mean, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, Yeshua said, and you lose your own soul? Or what would you trade for your soul? I mean, are you willing to trade um, the eternal for the temporary? And this new creature that we are, we're trading the temporary for the eternal. In other words, God wants us to think eternally now, and think spiritually and, and have a relationship with our Father who is spirit, and we're still trying to figure things out and live as the old person, and it's not working. And we're frustrated, and we don't know why. And I, I've been through this myself. That's why I'm up here. Because I'm just sharing my experiences with you that the quicker you get it, and the quicker you go forward, and the quicker you learn... You know, because when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. And if you can't say amen, say, oh, me. I mean, one of the toughest things as a child of God, as a spiritual child of God, is to let go of the world. Because we were born in this world, we're kind of grabbed on here for dear life. And, and when you grab onto the world, you know what happens to you? You're limited. God wants to let go, let, come on, let go. You got that death grip, let it go, let it go. He like, pick up your cross. You know, it's not a flat, I'm not taking you on a flash walk. No luggage required. Don't be dragging stuff. With, don't, don't, don't bring me your old luggage. I mean, just let everything go. Let, let me take you. Let me take you on this new amazing journey this eternal journey that started the moment you got born again, and we're like dragging, and we're like, ah, I don't want to let go, this is so... And we struggle, and we wrestle. We wrestle with God like Jacob. Right, Chris? Jacob struggling with God? Who won that, who won that match? In this corner, we have Jacob. And in that corner, we have God. Who are we betting on? Who won that fight? You know, submit to God. 
Resist the devil. He will flee. So we were, we, we were children. But when the fullness of the time was come, verse 4, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. In other words, a lot of people don't understand this. Because, oh, that means we're, no, we're lawless. No, if you're attached to the law, you can't be led of the Spirit. Hello? In other words, you've got to let go of the instructions and grab onto the instructor. Amen. Big difference. Because if you're grabbed onto the instructions, you won't grab onto the instructor. But what happens when you grab onto the instructor? You're now above the law. You're not lawless. You're now, you're now a spiritual law-abiding citizen of heaven. Are you with me? We don't throw the law out. We just release it because we're, we're grabbing onto the lawgiver. How many of us a huge difference? You can grab the instructions or you can grab the instructor. What are you grabbing onto? What's better? Because the law is good. The law is holy. The law is good. But if you're led of the law, you're not led of the Spirit. Hola. And if you're led of the Spirit, will the Spirit cause you to be lawless? No, he will show you how to fulfill the law. And it won't be a burden. Are you with me? Because some people say, well, you know, we're just going to throw the law out the window. And, and many people have tried. I myself tried that. We're, we're, when I took it literally, I'm not under the law. No, don't give me any laws, please. You know? How did that work for you? Not very well. So what do you mean I'm not under the law? Well, Grab on to the lawgiver and see how it goes for you. I mean, know oh, this covenant is a little tricky, but once you get it, once you understand it, it's an amazing walk with God because it says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by who? Yeshua, Jesus. Now, question, did Jesus break the law to be led of the Spirit? No, he was sinless. So you could actually be led of the Spirit and be lawful. Oh, 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 we got something here. Because remember, he's the way, he's the truth, and he's life. But we got a whole set of people going, no, let's throw the law out the window and let's be led of the Spirit and let's just do whatever. People start barking like dogs. People start rolling on the aisles. People start screaming. That's spirit-led. No, that's crazy. You guys are out of control, and you're calling that spiritual? I don't see Jesus there. Somebody say, I need to see Jesus. Your behavior has to match his behavior. If you're acting crazy, that ain't Jesus. I don't care what you call it. Oh, that's so spiritual. No, that's crazy. Don't act crazy and say that's Jesus because he was not crazy. He cast out the demons out of crazy people and they became normal. Yeshua was not crazy. Don't act crazy and say that's spiritual, okay? Because I will tell you, you're crazy. Hello? Hello? Are we going to lift him up or are we going to lift up crazies up? Anyway, you can start out crazy, but then he will calm you down. Because to be led of the Spirit, you've got to be calm. To hear from God, you can't be... I mean, you can't be loco de la cabeza. You know, you've got you to gotta, you gotta be sober... You got to be vigilant 
because the adversary walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may. You got to be sober. You got to be vigilant. You got to be, you got to be focused. Amen. In order to live this new life, you got to be spiritually focused. You got to be laser focused. The Lord said, if your eye is single, your body will be filled with light. I mean, you got to be focused. Focus. You got to focus. I mean, this, this is new creature academy. We're here. I'm talking to a bunch of new creatures. And what are we trying to do here? Trying to talk you out of being an old creature. I mean, that's basically what I'm doing. I'm like, hey, guys, you're new creatures. You know, accept it. Embrace it. Say, this is awesome. And I want to live this way. And I only got 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years to do it. So if you don't do it now, in heaven you're not going to need to do it because you'll be there. And it'll be like, you want to live by faith. You want to be led of the Spirit. You're going to see your Father. You're going to see everybody. You're going to see the light. I mean, you're not going to have to believe anything. It'll be right in your face. Here on this side, you got it's a little tricky. You know, those that come to him must believe that he is. So without faith, it's impossible to please him. Those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. In other words, here in this, in this side of heaven, in these physical bodies, there are certain, um, what's the word I want to use? Instructions, uh, lessons that we need to learn that he would teach us because he took on flesh and blood and he showed us the way, the truth, and the life, and he showed us how to operate in these physical bodies led of the Holy Spirit. As a full heir of God. And I mean, if we can be honest, we're not even full, we're not even half heirs. We're more like half assed, if we, you know. <laughs> I don't mean to insult anybody, but I mean, if we if we just got a little bit better instruction and we got a little bit more serious and we got a little bit more with the program. I mean, God would show us this amazing walk that's waiting for each and every one of us. This amazing spiritual walk, this amazing relationship with our Father in heaven through the person of the Holy Spirit, through what came out of the mouth of Yeshua to show us this way, this truth, and this life. And let me tell you something. Our life would be so amazing. And people would see this. In other words, why are we chasing people to try to Give them the gospel. They should be chasing us. They should be like, whoa, what are you? You're this amazing human being. You have this insight. You have this divinity about you. Nothing scares you. And you seem to know all these things that are going to happen before they happen. Are you clairvoyant? Are you a soothsayer? Can you tell the future? Can you read my palm, please? Yes, this line right here, you're going to have a long life. This line here, you're going to be rich. No, that's baloney. God's going to show you things to come through the person of the Holy Spirit. You're no longer going to live carnally minded and thinking about yourself and worrying about everything. You're not going to live this way anymore. You're going to live super naturally as this new, as this amazing heir of God to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive what? I mean, honestly, if you put yourself under the law, are you walking like a child of God? Or are you walking like some, of, some kind of instructional robot? I must keep the Sabbath... I must not do this. I must not do that. Hello? Was Yeshua like that? I mean, is this what's waiting for each and every one of us? So do we understand now why he said that he came to redeem us that were under the law? Because remember, God had interaction with Israel but he gave them laws. Moses had a personal relationship with God, but the children of Israel only got the instructions. They, didn't, they, weren't, they weren't allowed to have a, a relationship with the instructor. 
They had the instructions. And they were to keep the instructions under penalty of death. That's what they had. Now, he took the punishment and died for the penalty of not keeping the instructions or the laws of God. But now he says, let me move inside you through this amazing promise of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, and now you're going to live on a much higher supernatural level that it won't be so difficult to be a law-abiding citizen of heaven. To those that received them, the Bible says, gave you the power to become the sons of God. In other words, we now have received the adoption of sons. In other words, you got to get that through your head. I'm a child of God now. Come on now. I wasn't a child of God before. When I wasn't a child of God, old things, that's my old life. All things have become new. I'm a child of God now. Come on now. I belong to him. He's in me. He's with me. He's promised never to leave me. Can I learn to acknowledge him now in all my ways? Can I develop some spiritual ears now to hear him? I need to hear from him. I need to hear what he wants me to do and what he wants me to say. I need to hear his voice. Do you think that takes a little training? I mean, how many people? Um, we have a college course on how to hear the voice of God. Is there such a course? No. You go to college, you learn math, you learn science. We're still studying how the world was made. When you now have the, the, the creator of heaven and earth living inside you, and you're still looking through a microscope trying to figure it out. Okay, have fun. I'm looking at the creator. I'm looking at our father. I'm looking at every, someone who's made everything and someone who's adopted me now and he's calling me his son. But as long as the heir is a child, as long as we're immature, as long as we don't understand, as long as this promise, this amazing covenant that God has for us is actually being wasted. And, 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 the, and, and, and the people paying the price for that is us. Because, I mean, in case you didn't get the memo, you have limited time here. Like I sent a photograph to somebody who took a picture here seven years ago, and I said, that was seven years ago. He goes, time flies. Yeah, no kidding. Seven years has gone by. Hopefully in the last seven years you've come to the Mishkan. You've learned some things about this new life that God has for you. You're, try, you, you're, you're practicing hearing from God. You're practicing worshiping in spirit and truth. You're practicing being led of the Holy Spirit. And if that bores you and that bothers you and you think that that's repetition... You know, go to one of these places. They all they talk is about money in Jesus' name. You know, knock yourself out. I hope you make a lot of money in Jesus' name. So when you die, you'll leave it to your next of kin. And they'll get to enjoy it for your stupidity. Because in case you haven't noticed, you can't take anything with you. So, and you missed out on this amazing spiritual life that God has for you that has nothing to do with money. If you noticed, you know how much Jesus cared about money? You know, you hear about Jesus talked about money? You know how much Jesus cared about money? He let the thief carry the money. And he knew he was a thief. That was his treasurer. If you think about it, Jesus, you're crazy, man. You let a thief carry the money because everything he did had nothing to do with money. It, it had everything to do with the Holy Spirit. It had, every, it had everything to do with the supernatural. The money was secondary. And he gave no mind to it. He said, think not what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live. Don't lay treasures on earth, he tells them, where moth and rust and thieves, they come and steal it and they destroy it. He says, that's not what the kingdom is about anymore. It's not about it's not about wealth. It's not about physical wealth anymore. It's about spiritual wealth. Are you guys with me? We didn't have time to get to Acts chapter 1 to be continued as we count down to the promise of the Father. Do you mind talking about this in a, for the next few weeks? Do you mind?
We don't mind? We don't mind? Anybody against? Please leave. Anybody watching? Turn it off. Let's stand up and honor him, please. As we continue, we'll continue this. We got the Torah portion tomorrow, but then we'll continue about as we count. Because every Shabbat, every Friday night, we're counting the weeks, right? Towards the promise of the, what was the promise of the Father? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Year and A, Pentecost, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. Amen. Good talk. Somebody say, good talk. Was this like a TED talk? No, this was a Jesus talk. This is better than a TED talk. This is a Yeshua talk. Yeshua was talking. Somebody said, I'm listening. I'm listening. Hear, O Israel, I'm listening. Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you tonight. Father in heaven, we are willing. We are willing vessels. We wish to learn. We're hungry. We're thirsting for righteousness. You promise to fill us. Lead us. Lead us to green pastures, still waters. Restore our souls. Show us mercy and goodness all the days of our life, Lord. Show us this amazing walk. Show us this amazing promise. Show us this amazing covenant that you have made with us. Covenant. Agreement. We come in agreement with you, Father. In heaven, as touching this shall be done. We're hungry. We're thirsty for knowledge and wisdom. We want to learn about this new life, this new experience, this new walk, this amazing promise that you've made us, Lord. We wish to be full heirs of this. And Father in heaven, we want to give up our childishness, our immaturity. Father, like you told, like you told the nation of Israel, that you shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Teach us to live this way. Let us acknowledge you in all of our ways. Let us not lean anymore upon our own understanding and let us and let you lead and guide our paths, Lord. We honor you, Father in heaven. We ask that you lead us. We submit ourselves to you and we resist the adversary, the spirit of disobedience, working in the children of disobedience. Thank you, Lord. We're no longer married to the instructions. We are now married to the instructor. Thank you that we no longer have a spirit of bondage on us, but we have a spirit of adoption. Well, we now cry, Abba, Father, our Father who is in heaven. And in his name we pray tonight, the name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus. In his name we pray and the people of God said, Amen. Give the Lord a big hand. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching with us as we count the Sabbath. We'll just keep counting. We close in worship and the bedtime shema. Please stay and break some leaven bread. Oh. We still have matzahs if you want.
And as always, okay, uh, we're this, uh, service is dismissed tonight until tomorrow morning. We'll be here at 11 a.m. and we certainly hope you'll join us. Um, we encourage you, as always, to stay. Um, encourage each other to love and good works. Have a cup of chicken soup and a piece of challah bread and enjoy the fellowship with our Heavenly Father and our fellowship with one another. We're going to say the bedtime Shema, not before we thank all every single volunteer who volunteers their time, their finances, their efforts, oh, every, every way they can. If you're tuning in for the first time, just want you to know that this ministry is entirely supported through voluntary efforts and we're grateful um, because the Lord keeps the doors open through uh, the, the efforts of people who are obedient, hear his voice, and, uh, and volunteer here at the Mishkan. So we're grateful for that. We're going to say the bedtime Shema is always to make sure that our hearts are in the right place so that when we come in to worship tomorrow morning that our prayers will not be hindered, but rather they will rise as a sweet incense to the throne of grace. Okay, so join me. Here we go. Sovereign of the universe, before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, body, work, or all that's mine. Whether willful, careless, accidental, purposeful, or through their speech, by word or by deed, in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. Shabbat Shalom. Laila Tov. See you in the morning.